Welcome to the series Against All Odds, Crafting a Career in the Arts. According to Statistics Canada, around 19% of the population are living with some form of disability that affects their level of freedom, independence, or quality of life. Of that population, a percentage are invisibly disabled, which means they may look and act healthy, but are living with a chronic condition. Having an invisible disability could happen to anyone at any time and can include autoimmune diseases, brain injuries and strokes, chronic pain, mental or psychological disorders, among others. People with invisible disabilities may not be able to work a full-time schedule or may need a modified schedule based on how they feel. But having an invisible disability doesn't mean living your dream is completely impossible. In this series, we will share with you stories of invisibly disabled professional craft artists who work or sell their art in Edmonton. We have also included valuable community resources that are important for any artist who wants to begin their career. I'm Amy, an award-winning artist and filmmaker who is invisibly disabled. And together with my husband, Tanner, I will be sharing the stories of local artists with invisible disabilities. And I will take you to different places in the community to show you where support is available. It is our hope that with this series, anyone looking to begin their art career will know where the supports and resources exist in our community. We also hope if you are invisibly disabled, the stories of the artists included in this series will help you see how it is possible to have a career in the arts or inspire you to explore the artistic medium you have been curious about. Welcome back. If you have ever wanted to get some advice from a seasoned artist but haven't had a chance, please follow along to meet our next guest. We are also going to talk to someone who pursues their craft part-time alongside her other work. We're at the Royal Alberta Museum in downtown Edmonton. In this episode, we're going to speak with an established professional artist who sold his work throughout Canada and the United States. He's going to tell us a bit about what he makes and his advice for those just getting started. Hi, uh, this is Glenn Nipshank. I am from Slave Lake, Alberta. Originally, I was born in Athabasca, Otida. Grew up in Smith, it was a 100 year anniversary, and I live here in Edmonton, Alberta, Otida. That's where I'm from now. Oh yeah, the type of artwork I do is uh, mostly pottery, uh, three-dimensional, hand-built, coil-built, meaning you put coils in, there's a method of making a piece that grows. It's time and space. Or the central kind of pottery my teacher taught me was Jackie Stevens, and she was my teacher for years as her apprentice, and that's how I got involved with it, painting in the first place. And the other thing I do is the painting, but that's another thing I did before I did pottery.
Hi, my inspirations are, well, I was thinking about this. Uh, I think I got a lot of it from my mother, Margaret. She always give me something and pushes me towards my craft and art as when I was young. And she was always making this Alberta roses and beadswork and she sews, she makes these beautiful uh, will work, you know, like knits, socks and stuff maybe for Christmas, <laughs> stuff like that. But she inspired me a lot to keep working. Also, I like work with uh, nature, water, lakes, and the stories comes from the old people that inspired me. My inspiration I get from them. With the stories they told me, I like to give out what I like to have a legacy for them when I do my artwork, so I can actually incorporate that with images on pieces, like a four direction pot I do for grandfathers. I always have buffalo, bear, uh, eagle, and uh, wolf or so. Those are our spirit guides or spirit uh, helpers. It's also artists, other artists. When they do something, we like to imitate it somehow. I mean, I first started, and it was like paintings first. Sometimes they do something and interacting with them and doing these shows. Uh, you get a relationship. It's just like a homecoming uh, reunion. Yeah, how I got started my art? Well, I'll, one day I was piling lumber, this slave lake mill, and I said, what am I going to do this all my life, piling lumber? I had to do something. I just went to school in Vancouver, NEC, they call it Native Education Center in Vancouver. I got my grade 12 there, then I went to New Mexico for my 2D, 3D fine arts degree. That's where the beginning was in making the bigger shows after I graduated. It took like 10 years to get really good at it. I have some advice for artists that want to get into big shows and doing these shows actually when you start off you, you grow in time your art are you collectible they always say and you, if you're really collectible you have a fan base it gets larger and larger the more invites you get from other museums my advice is that you learn from other artists from the what they do and they'll actually give you some advice as well how to get in but it's always word of mouth from other artists and the shows that are big like Indian Market uh, that's how I got started too I learned from watching artists and meeting artists uh, that's how I would start off too and then you can see if you can get into these shows by going to these markets uh, Yeah, I have some advice for new artists. Uh, when you start off, uh, you should just keep uh, at it. What you're doing, you're always, what you're good at is gonna take you places. You know, art will take you places, the more you do it. Number two for artists that are starting out to get recognized, I would just suggest that you go to these shows and meet artists. There's so many art shows in the summer. I can go to these openings, meet artists, interact. You'll start knowing people. It's always about interacting with other artists too and clients and collectors. When you go to homes and stuff, the tips are that you just go out there and interact with people. It's, and then you'll get recognized in time. <laughs> the third tip here is like when you travel places, uh, I like to go into the museums and uh, it's always good to actually go visit the galleries and the stores and then see how and visually look at the place. Is your work is going to be, would it work in this place? With the atmosphere too? You have to kind of see if your work will actually fit in well with that. It's all about what kind of gallery it is and so forth. I think you have to interact and see where they're going with their gallery. New work is always something they like and sometimes they depends and they're hesitant about it. But you have to be a little bold and come in there. Don't be uh, one of these shy artists, oh, you know, not good enough, whatever. 
you don't even know until you show it. I've seen the worst art in the world that sells for millions and millions of dollars. So what's the difference, eh? You can't be, you can't be structured like that. So I always think, just be persistent. Yeah, what I wish I knew back then and what I wish now is that uh, I wish I could do more. Like, the thing, because the older you get, the more, oh, I get stiff. Really. But I was doing that in my prime, making a big, bigger piece. And uh, that thing is, I should have just stayed smaller, medium, not so big, and uh, get more. I did enough discipline, but not enough uh, staying home even. I was out there too much and never had time for my family. I hope you found that informative and get a chance to check out the museum next time you're in downtown Edmonton. Now we are on our way to talk to an Edmonton craft artist who sells locally at boutique shops and small shows. She offers advice for artists who want to get started selling their work. My name is Megan and I own and run Tizzy's Treasures. I started selling in 2016, but I've been making jewelry since about 2012. I bought some random beading stuff from Walmart, intending to make myself some little hair things, and uh, never actually made those little hair things, and it just kind of spiraled from there and turned into jewelry, and I was rapidly making more jewelry than I could actually wear. And then in 2016, um, I had lost my job, and my mom said, hey, why don't you start that uh, jewelry business that you've been talking about? And so I did. And then it just kind of continued from there. My top tips for new artists looking to make packaging for their uh, handmade items, definitely figure out where it's worth spending the money first. Like for me, I can't draw a stick figure, nothing. So it made sense for me to invest in getting a logo made. Another tip would be making sure you have clear pricing, uh, especially if you're doing a market table, whether that's signs or everything labeled clearly. A lot of people aren't going to ask questions, they're going to look to see what your prices are. So you're better off, I find, giving them all the information they might not necessarily ask for before they decide to leave. And people like kind of rifling through bins of things. So whether that's you put, um, your stuff on cards like this so people can kind of flip through um, or you put you know just a big old mixed bin. People seem to really like that tactile part of shopping. It gets people drawn into your table a bit more. If you're looking to get into doing craft shows definitely do your research into all your local shows. If possible attend them to see what kind of people show up, how many people show up, how things are laid out if you like the vibe of the place, if your products will fit in with the other products that are on display. Um, and also be creative with your table setup. You don't have to spend a whole bunch of money on brand new displays. Like with jewelry, jewelry displays can get really expensive and really bulky. My first few markets, about half of my display were things that I made myself with stuff I bought from the dollar store. One of the things that I've learned through doing markets it, that's helped me kind of grow as a craft vendor and as a crafter is to kind of know when to stick to my guns um, and to make what I want to make. And also that sizing matters when it comes to jewelry. And that's, I went into it being, you know, someone on the bigger side. I've had problems finding, buying bracelets for myself um, and necklaces fit me differently just because I'm a larger size. So having a flexibility within my jewelry, I've seen that get a really good response from people as well. I've had customers come up to my table thinking, you know, I can't buy anything here because nothing will fit me. And then I tell them I can custom make the bracelet for them and they just light up 
and that makes a huge difference and it makes me so happy because I know what they feel like. I've been to shops and not been able to buy the really pretty jewelry because it just doesn't fit. I do recommend at least considering selling in stores or galleries. If that's something that interests you, it is kind of its own extension of your work. Um, whether you do wholesale or consignment, there's lots of other work that you have to do around it, like preparing all your wholesale documents, uh, contacting stores and galleries. It can definitely be worth it, especially if you're like me and you can't drive. So traveling to markets is tricky. Getting your stuff into stores means you're getting your stuff out there more often. When I started selling, definitely one of the hardest things that I've had to work on and that I'm still working on is kind of the idea of selling myself. I've got literal years of retail experience under my belt, but I've always been selling other people's things. So I've been able to mask and sell the products based on what I know about the products. When you're selling your own crafts, you are selling a little bit of yourself as well sometimes a little bit more of it of yourself. So that's been difficult for me because I've never been the type to kind of celebrate my own strengths as much as I should. So standing behind a table and trying to convince people that yes, what I make is pretty and it's of value and you should buy it and you should wear it. That's a different skill that I had to learn unexpectedly. And like I said, I'm still working on it and because I'm not perfect at it. And also, crowds are exhausting. They're, they're just, they're exhausting. I'm an introvert talking to people for eight hours a day. It's a lot. It's a lot. Uh, that's something I've been working on, uh, like I said, both myself, but also because I'm in a bunch of vendor groups on Facebook and talking about, you know, the experience of selling in a craft market as a socially anxious introvert because that's not my natural place to be. And yeah, I've got retail experience, so I know how to mask. And, and I've done markets with my mom before I started doing my jewelry. But again, that was somebody else's products. Like you have to handle your entire business differently when you're an introvert. And it's hard to do that sometimes because there aren't a lot of resources on it. Most people, you know, they talk about, you have to be an extrovert, you have to do this, you have to do that. And I'm like, I can't. And there's a lot of other crafters like me who are introverts and who are socially anxious, but they want to sell. But, you know, I've been trying to be a bit more open with suggestions on, you know, how to prepare yourself for a market or what things to bring or, you know, how I keep myself occupied, how I keep myself level and, you know, keep from having my anxiety go bonkers. Cause I've had really bad days in a market and it's not a fun time and you definitely don't sell anything. <laughs> So just in general, if you're starting out in market, I'd recommend you definitely have some kind of card reader. It does make a big difference being able to take credit and debit cards. You definitely wanna have lots of business cards with you. You wanna hand those out to everybody. I have them on the front of my table. I also hand them out to anybody who buys from me. And have a really good logo as well. My first logo was handmade. <laughs> I found free clip art. It was not good. <laughs> I did not put it on business cards or anything. And when I invested in mine, I found a really lovely lady out of the UK. But it definitely helps to make your brand stand out if you have that logo. It's not that expensive if you go to the right person and it makes a big deal. As Glenn said, other artists really are a community resource. They have accumulated a lot of information and knowledge, so don't be afraid to email them or contact them through social media to ask for advice. The worst thing they might do is not reply. Glenn also offered insights into things he wishes he knew about work-life balance when he started. As you heard from Megan's discussion about anxiety, if you're anxious, you're not alone, and you can still pursue your dream of having a craft business, even if you're an introvert. She also provided valuable tips for packaging and booth setup for artists at any stage. <laughs>